Welcome to Mission, God at Work, Faith in Action, a program that shows what God is doing all around the world. I'm Diane Becker. And I'm Steve Saint. You know, statistics show that there are 100 million children in the world who are homeless. Without a home, they grow up on city streets. Here's one program reaching out to street children in Brazil. It's five o'clock in the morning. In a couple of hours, the streets will be clogged with commuters on their way to work. Most of them will be too rushed to notice and too preoccupied to care for the children whose home is the very streets they travel on. Their bed is a sheet of cardboard beneath a statue of the Pope or a park bench or under a pier where the stench of rotting food and excrement has long been forgotten in a haze of glue sniffing and drugs. For Lynn McCleavy, this too is her home. She's one of a number of UFM missionaries based in Belen, and it's the city's street children which God has laid on her heart. This morning, it's her turn to take coffee and rolls to one of the gangs that live in the old part of the city. She's accepted by them as a trusted friend. First of all, we do relationship building on the streets, getting to know the kids, finding out the areas that they go to, the things that they're involved in in the street, showing an interest in their lives, getting alongside them, not judging them, helping them, the ones that uh, have got cuts and wounds, I'm a nurse, so I help in, in that area, getting them to a hospital if needed, helping on the, the general physical side. There is a risk of working with street children because of the, the danger, because people are using drugs. It's very violent. Three times I've been held up by somebody with a knife. The danger has not deterred Lynn's colleague, Rita Bornhoser. Lynn and Rita make a good team, which is just as well, as there are few people working full-time with Belen's street children. This carefree scene belies the fact that most of these children are emotionally wounded. Rejected by their family and left to make their own way in a hostile world, their behavior can be highly unpredictable. The more difficult they are, the more I enjoy the challenge and, and really getting close to them, finding a the key to, to get alongside them, get to know them, because a lot of people keep the distance. I think from my own background as well and the school that I went to and the way people treat you from that area, I think that, that helped me to get close to children that uh, other people didn't care about. When you're unloved and unwanted, there's not much point to life. It's even harder when you've been sexually abused and no one believes you. You have to escape. The only way to dull the pain is through drugs which are expensive, or glue which is cheap, but just as dangerous. Girls are especially at risk. Life on the streets for them can be violent. For many girls, there's only one way to get money and ease the loneliness. They sell their bodies for sex. Beleng has the highest percentage of child prostitutes in Brazil, twice the national average. The more mature girls openly ply their trade in daylight. They become pregnant and can't afford an abortion. With an extra mouth to feed, they need more money, so they go back on the streets. But it's at night when the real tragedy of the street children takes place. In dark corners, young girls, no more than 11 or 12, sell themselves to whoever wants them. And in a busy port like Beleng, there are plenty of takers. For Lynn and Rita, it's the plight of such girls that has moved them to take action and offer help of a very practical nature. About an hour's drive out of Beleng is Saint Isabel. It's a sleepy little town, only one main street, a few shops, some bars, and not much else. Life here is lived in the slow lane. It's just the right place for UFM's home for girls off the streets. It's also Lynn's home. 
The house in Santa Isabel is open for girls that doesn't, don't have anywhere else that they can live. That's the only place that's available for them. Their family contact is, is so bad or they don't have any family, but they can't go anywhere else. No one else will have them. Lenny is 17, and when she's not picking lemons, she's looking after her little baby. Amanda is only 15 and is six months pregnant. Like Lenny, she too has spent most of her life on the streets, but now has found a home. The home is large but needs some renovation. It could accommodate a lot more girls and there's plenty of space for further development. But right now, they just can't accept any more. Lynn and Rita are the only full-time workers available to run the home and they desperately need more workers, and not just women. We would like male workers because the girls need male role models as well because up until now the girls have been abused, used, and they're just seen as objects by men. So it'd be nice to have male workers to show a different side of how men are. Ideally, the home needs a married couple to provide a balanced family atmosphere, one in which these abused and damaged girls can find healing and real love. <laughs> Happiness is a long-forgotten emotion for Lene and Amanda, but they're beginning to experience it once again. Perhaps, as they have their own children and enjoy the security of a loving home, the pain they've known for so long will fade into a distant mist. For Amanda, that could take a long time. I couldn't stay in my mother's house. I didn't get on with her. I was sent to a government home. It was terrible. The other girls were always threatening to kill each other. One of the girls took me to the streets. She showed me what it was like, and it was better than being in the home. But she sold me to some men, and I ended up in prostitution until I was 14. The police were always threatening to kill me because I reported them to the papers, that they were beating us up on the street. They got really angry. The crazy police came after me. There were threats from other boys on the streets. They'd stab us and steal our money. Then two girls arrived and asked if I'd like to visit the house at Santa Isabel. It's much better. I prefer to stay here than be on the street. How can you tell those whose lives have been so blighted that God really loves them? Well, in one sense, you can't. You have to show it. Words are meaningless. Actions are everything. The one vital factor is time, being available night and day, week after week, month after month. Only then will you be trusted and accepted. And then they may listen as you introduce Jesus to them. It's demanding, heart-rending work. In this work with the street children, I found that there's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. You're working with kids that could, could be injured during the night or could be dead, killed during the night. So there's a lot of stress in the work. There's, I found that there's stress. I've had stress with colleagues, uh, tensions in the work. And I remember at one point, I felt that only God was there, that God was helping me get through. This is El Inaldo. He's now 17 years old and was on the streets for five years. His story is what this work is all about. El Inaldo comes from Brevis, a small town on the Amazon. It's a full day's sail upriver from Beleng. His troubles began when his father remarried. <laughs> My stepmother used to beat me up, and my brothers were always fighting, so I ran away from home. I got on a boat and ended up here in Belém. I would nowhere to go, so I went on the streets. I got food by begging and stealing. There was a group, and most days they brought us coffee and food. I told Lynn and Rita that I wanted to get off the streets, and they arranged for me to go into a recuperation house. 
There were other boys there who were like brothers to me, and they used to pray with me. They asked if I wanted to accept the Lord. I said yes, and he gave me a new life of happiness and peace. And today I'm here, and I want to stay firm with the Lord until the end. You can connect with the mission agency UFM International at UFM.org. If you don't know the political situation in Burma, or Myanmar as some call it now, you might be surprised to know that there are more than 100,000 Burmese refugees living just across the Burma border in Thailand. They're seeking refuge from a violent dictator. Mm -hmm. They've been there for 15 years. In refugee camps, they have food and shelter, but no freedom. My aunt and uncle, college professor, spent eight months teaching in a refugee camp. It changed their life. The faces of these young Burmese children are very charming. But the story of the people of Burma is a very sad story. Ignorance and ethnic hatred have contributed to a violent conflict, which itself breeds further hatred. And so there's a continuing cycle of violence to which these people have been subject for many, many years. Some people have simply left Burma to seek refuge in Thailand or India. Other people have been uprooted from their homes within Burma and are seeking a place to live within their own land. We believe that the only hope for lasting peace and justice in Burma lies in the empowerment of its people through education. We want you to meet some of these people, to hear their stories, and see how their lives have been changed through education. Mela is a refugee camp. It has about 30,000 Burmese people. Most of them here are Karin. They are the largest of the ethnic minority groups in Burma, and they have been fighting a civil war with that country for over 50 years. In this camp, you will find cultured people who have university degrees, and you will find hill tribe people who have never had any education at all. Most of my life in refugee camp, I, I do as a teacher. Mm -hmm. One of our closest friends is Na Tamla. She's the daughter of a Karin army major. After completing her degree at the university, she was called by her father to establish a home and a school for orphan children. For me, the most important thing I think education, the one the one I interest and the one I can help my people. Some say life as a refugee is not that bad. Food, shelter, and medical care is provided. But there is no freedom. We also have education for our children, except that we can do nothing. We cannot go as other people. We cannot work as other people. So many, many people now only think about the we are lost a lot of human rights. A few years ago, when we were visiting a friend in the agricultural region south of Nesot, we happened upon a small group of migrant farm workers and their families. It was one of the most depressing moments of our lives. These people had left Burma in circumstances of desperate poverty to find, somehow, a better life. They were living little better than animals in huts of sticks and plastic without any services of any kind. The Brackett Foundation came with an offer to provide funds for building a school and salaries for teachers. Now, with the work of their own hands and the help of our foundation, we have schools and the beginnings of community.
Education for refugees is very difficult, but some are bright enough to defy the odds and prepare themselves for advanced degrees. Timolet is one of the students who participated in the uprising of 1988. And the army truck came. We thought, it, oh, they will not shoot. We suppose they won't be shooting. Shoot. But actually, they shoot all. So that's a lot of students, they die. And a lot of students die near the Rangu University compound. He fled to the jungle and joined the military forces of the Burma students. If they see anybody on the road, they kill. So the students or the people cannot walk, cannot walk on the road or cannot stay in the jungle. He suffered military combat, disease and wounds, but he lived to return to help his people. I am very, very sure that why I learn I study here is I want to walk with the people. That now I am in the, I feel I am in the right way to help the people. This is the way our people need. So after I graduate, I, after I have more knowledge, I go back to my people. Timolat is now studying medical science at Mahidol University International in Bangkok. He is supported in part by one of our scholarships. Wars seem to bring out the best and the worst in people, and Burma has some classic examples, starting with Aung San Suu Kyi. Her moral authority and courage, facing up to a brutal military dictatorship, has won her the admiration of the civilized world. Another example is Dr. Cynthia, who left Burma in 1988 to help her people. She has stayed on the border ever since to run a charity clinic for refugees and the poor people of her country. The reason I have to be here a long time is to educate the people uh, for new generation. You see, the people on the border doesn't have not much information or they just don't know what uh, they have been suffering from. Those who know Dr. Cynthia and the difficult circumstances of her life and work sometimes ask what keeps her here on the border in this charity clinic. Most of the time they struggle for the survival, mainly food and the shelter security. So sometimes it is hard to educate or it is not easy to uh, educate them to involve or to change the to change the, their um, habit or their culture. At the same time, we have to respect their culture and we have to promote them uh, to be aware of more, more problems. So it, it will take some time, not, not only for one year, two years, it will take for five years, six years, 10 years. Of course, medical service is not the only thing that happens at Dr. Cynthia's. Her staff people marry and have children, and they must have a school. Our foundation is happy to be able to provide a nursery and primary school for the children of Dr. Cynthia's. For a small organization, our projects are quite diverse. We are supporting a group which publishes a children's magazine. It's written in Burmese and distributed to all the refugee camps along the border. Burmese was chosen specifically to encourage attention to the common language of Burma over the multitude of ethnic tongues. It is the only material the children have to read which is non-political and appropriate for their age group. The foundation supports adult education programs in computer use and in Thai language study grants for individuals wishing part-time study, and internships to allow some to learn while working for an organization that helps their people. We wonder what we as individuals might do to help. The answer, unfortunately, is not simple. Whenever you give some aids, you always need to encourage and to promote our government. 
in terms of changing the policy on health or education or well-being of the people. Our people never give up. We still have hope to be get uh, to be got freedom and peace in our in our country. One day, some time ago, my friend Cory Tu and I were sitting along the banks of this river, and he was looking over to his lost country and grieving. And he said to me, referring to the military government in Burma, he said, if they would just give us a small strip of land along this river, perhaps only a mile wide, just enough for us to settle and live in peace, then we would be happy. Cory Tu, we cannot promise that you will ever be able to return to your land, but we can tell you that we have already discussed plans to build a school there for your people and for their future. When you talk with these refugees, many of them will tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. I want to help my people. For more information about the educational project to Burmese refugees, here's the website you can log on to, bracketcolgate.edu. Shaping eternity, that's what missions is all about. Expanding the kingdom. Glorifying God, planning churches, mm -hmm. and making disciples of all the nations. Much of mission work is being done by the Western world, but the Great Commission was given to all Christians everywhere. That's sure. the premise of a book written by Steve called The Great Omission. When we leave our indigenous brothers and sisters out of our plans to reach the world, we're making the Great Commission into a spectator sport, mm -hmm. which it never was intended to be. Our Great Omission is leaving them out. Your wife Jenny was telling me about a missionary in Africa who recently said that he and his team had spent years planting churches, mm -hmm. just a couple of churches, yeah. but after reading The Great Omission, they started helping national believers start churches, and they have lots of churches that are self-supporting. You can order the book through the iTech website, itechusa.org. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Mission.